the Deuteronomy 24 and verse 1. So now this was always uh, this was always a question, or, uh, or excuse me, this was always um, how can I put it? A particular these were like this was like a particular chapter, and this was like verses one through verses one through five were like you know kind of like uh, question marks for me, you know. I put it that way. They were like question marks for me dealing with this dealing with this subject, right? Because you see, you know, you see other. Uh, you see other aspects in the scripture where it shows you there's a there's a judgment for a woman that's uh you know that that commits adultery right you know against her husband and you know you see that it's not tolerated you know what I'm saying amongst the people you know I may be I may be not looking at it as deep as maybe some other brothers maybe over time as you know I'm filled with more of the spirit I've gained more understanding of it you know of the subject. But right now, you know, this is uh, basically what, what my stance would be on it. Now, I've heard it broken down the sense to uh, this way, but I'll read it first. So it says in Deuteronomy 24, and verse 1, it says, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, so remember, they they already making made everything official. All right, he took her, he married her, right? And it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because, he has found some uncleanness in her, right? So he's found some sort of uncleanness in her, right? So now it says, <clears throat> then let him give, me, let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which take her to be his wife, her former husband, which has sent her away, may not take her to be his wife. After that, she is defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord uh, thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Right? So now, let's deal with, let's deal with verse 1 a little bit. So it says, uh, so he says, and, and it says, it comes to pass, she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her. Then let her write her a bill of, of divorce of divorcement. So now, this is my thing. All right. So now we know when a woman she goes and uh, so so basically like when that woman is divorced, right? Um, we're dealing with the we're dealing with the aspect of uh, you know she's she's pretty much she's committed some some sort of fornication, right? She then uh, you know. She didn't commit a, she didn't commit an adultery, you know. Pretty much, that's that's basically, you know, that's basically what you could think think about, right? When you when you breaking down this, uh, when you're looking at the scenario of it, found some sort of uncleanness, and that's how it was explained to me. All right, that's how it was explained to me at that time. All right, so now, um, this is what this is what I wanted to bring. This is what I wanted to bring out just to add to it a little bit. Uh, it says, and this is in uh, Ecclesiasticus uh, chapter 25, verses 16 through 24 um, in the Apocrypha. So when he's talking about he's found some sort of uncleanness in her, I mean, it's some sort of bad quality in this woman, right? You know, um, he would. this is what he would do, okay? And Ecclesiasticus 25 um, in starting at verses 16 to 24, explains that. So let's go there real quick. So when you look at it in other translations, it explains and it shows like how, you know, how it would have been some sort of, of quality, a bad quality in this woman. <clears throat> so now, Let's read this in Ecclesiastes. 
Ecclesiastes 25, and we started at verse uh, 16. And it says, I'd rather dwell with a lion and a dragon than to keep house with a wicked woman. Verse 17, the wickedness of a woman changes her face and darkens her countenance like sackcloth. So now, he says, so in the first part it said, I'd rather dwell in the house with a uh, lion and a dragon than to keep house with a wicked woman, right? So now when you're going back to uh, Deuteronomy 24 and 1, and it says that this, uh, he says when a man takes a wife and married her, and it come to pass, she find no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanliness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement. So remember, we're not, we're looking at it as if, you know, he's not divorcing this woman for every little cause, right? So remember, like when we go to Matthew chapter 19, um, where one of the Pharisees came to came to Christ and said, "Is it lawful for a man to for, for a man to put away a woman for every little thing, right?" And Christ and Christ had broken down to him, and we'll go there in uh, just a little bit. But I wanted to show you the uncleanliness that he would see in this woman. All right, first, first off, and this is the reason why he would divorce her, all right, or separate himself from her, and then she'd be able to go and be another man's wife. So it says. So it says, uh, the wickedness of a woman may, uh, of a woman changes her face and darkens her countenance like Santa Claus. So basically he's saying a woman that is extremely bipolar. You know, a wicked woman is like bipolar, right? You never know what type of attitude she's going to have, okay? That's why it says, a wicked woman changes her face and darkens her countenance like Santa Claus, all right? So she's all, she's, her moods are always a toss up, okay? So then it says, <clears throat> verse 18, her husband shall sit among his neighbors, and when he heareth it, shall sigh bitterly, right? It says, all wickedness is but little to the wickedness of a woman. Let her portion, let the portion of a sinner fall upon her, right? So now, when the husband is amongst his, amongst his friends, man, and it says, you know, it says when he hears of it, he, he's gonna he's gonna sigh bitterly, right? So when he has to deal with this woman who's extremely who's extremely wicked, you know, she's bipolar, right? He's gonna sit among his friends and sigh, man. When he gotta hear this woman's mouth, you know, he's gonna sigh bitterly, right? So that's why it says here, all wickedness is but little compared to the wickedness of a woman. Let the portion of her, uh, let the portion of a sinner fall upon her, so that let that let the sinner be the reward to this wicked woman, man. So it says, <clears throat> let's drop down and oh, let's finish reading. As the climbing up a sandy way is to the feet of the age, so is a wife full of words to a quiet man, right? So just like say for instance, a man is not a man is not getting anywhere in a conversation with a woman who's always. Uh, who, who's always combative with him, right? So that's why it says it's like climbing up, it's like climbing, climbing up, uh, climbing up a sandy way, right? So like you see a sand dune, right? Your seat constantly sinking in, right? You ain't getting nowhere with her, right? So it says that's why it says so is the wife full of words to a quiet man. He says stumble not at the beauty of a woman and desire her not for pleasure. So again, this is the wisdom that is is given, man. So it's like, look, this is what so Jesus and Sarah was saying. He's like, hey, don't stumble at the beauty of a woman. Why? Because he just he just mentioned to you that uh, uh, all wickedness is but little compared to the wickedness of a woman. You see what I'm saying? So be like it's like you see, man. Like you see on Love and Hip Hop and all that. You see all of those beautiful women on there, right? You know, gorgeous. But yet, they just wicked as hell, man. They got wicked intentions, adulterous, all of that. Evil eye. Anything you can think about. Slanderous. That's why it says just little. All right? So that's why it says stumble not at, the, at this woman's beauty. Why? Because you slip up and you sleep with this woman. That's your wife now. You see? Now you stuck with her. You see? But now check this out. So it says, verse 22, a woman, if she maintain her husband, is full of danger impudence and much reproach so it says if a woman if she maintain her husband is full of anger 
impudence and much reproach. So a woman that sits and says, she, you know, she, oh, I'm tired of taking care of this Negro, you know. Man is down on his luck, man, but she's getting upset, you know what I'm saying, because it's hard for the brother to find a job. You see, I'm looking at it in that aspect. So now check this out, verse 23. A wicked woman abateth courage, maketh a heavy countenance and wounded heart. So a wicked woman abateth courage. So she tell a wicked woman to take away the, uh, the courage of a man, and she'll make and she'll make a heavy countenance. His brother be looking depressed in the face because of his own wife, right? And a wounded heart, meaning that this man is going to be wounded within his uh, within his feelings, man. And he says, a woman that will not comfort her husband in distress maketh weak hands and feeble knees. So a woman that will not comfort her husband. She'll cause the woman to do what? Start praying. Lord, please get me out of this situation. Please. Please, Lord. I don't know what to do. I'll try everything. That's what this wicked woman that's what this wicked woman to do. Have a man on his hands and knees. But let's read. Of the woman came the beginning of sin, and through her we all die. Give the water no passage, neither a wicked woman liberty to gather abroad, right? So meaning to do what? To run around. So remember, like he says in Proverbs, a woman that abideth not in, not in her house. That's what the harlot does. You see what I'm saying? That's why Solomon was like, man, I've seen one of the simple ones among the people, you know what I'm saying? And I've seen a woman in the attire of a harlot, you know? So what do you think going to happen there? This was something that Solomon was witnessing. Well, this is something, this is some understanding that, you know, the Most High has given us right here. So now it says, give water no passage, neither give a, a wicked woman liberty to gab abroad. So you don't give, if a woman is wicked, you don't give her liberty, man, to go wherever the hell she wants. You see what I'm saying? The husband say, bring that behind home, you bring that behind home. He said, look, I expect you back in the house at a certain time. I expect you back in the house at a certain time. That's just how it is, you know. That's why he said a wicked woman. You don't give no wicked woman no liberty. You see what I'm saying? If your daughter was wicked, would you give her liberty to do whatever the hell she wants? Or would you, you would keep an iron fist upon her, right? You keep her, you keep her locked up. Pretty much. You know what I'm saying? Because if you allow her to do whatever the hell she wants, what, what's going to end up happening? She's going to come home pregnant. She's going to come home with the wrong man. She's going to be dealing with the wrong father. She's going to be all messed up. So it's basically the same thing with a woman. Alright? Or a man's wife. You know, he can't give this woman liberty to do whatever the hell she wants. So then he says, if she go not as thou wouldest, have her, cut her off from thy flesh, and give her a bill of divorce, and let her go. So if this woman fails, if this woman fails, this wicked woman fails to comply with the with the demands of her husband, right, or the commands of her husband, if he's leading her righteously, then he can say, look, you know what, here's this bill of divorce, man, go. Go, go do you. You know what I mean? That's what he said. He said, cut her, uh, he said, uh, cut her off from thy flesh and give her a bill of divorce and let her go. So going back to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 24 and 1, this was the, this was when she found no faith, when she found no favor in this man's sight. You see what I'm saying? So it's talking about a wicked woman. It could be talking about a woman that is righteous, because if a woman that was righteous, she'd be doing everything right. A man would have no uh, intentions of getting rid of this woman. You see? Just looking at it that way, the simple way, right? Nothing complex, nothing hard, right? So the wicked woman, all right, and he found some sort of uncleanness in her, meaning some sort of bad quality, man, or indecency in this woman, you see? So some sort of immorality that this woman had about herself. Now let's jump to, uh, uh, uh let's stay in Ecclesiastes and let's get 26. Let's get about, let's get about, let's get the shameless woman. Let's get the shameless woman. Again, this is the woman that this man would be divorced, all right? So now let's read this. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 26, and we'll get verse, mm, we'll, you know, what? we'll start We'll start at verse 8. We'll, we'll read verse 8, all right? So it says here, a drunken woman and a gather abroad causes great anger, and she will not cover her own shame, right? So as we said, a woman that's a gather abroad, meaning that she want to buy 
you know, she want to buy it in her own house. She's always out and about. She at the club. She doing whatever the hell she wants. You know what I mean? She running around. That's why it says a drunken woman, a woman that's intoxicated, you see? So that's why it says, you know, he says uh, she causes great anger. Have you not seen men become angry because their woman is always out? Have you not seen those films where, you know, you see the husband show up at the club because his woman ain't, his woman ain't at home? You see, that's what it's talking about. So he says, and she will not cover her own shame. So this woman, she won't what? She won't cover herself. All right, she won't get right. So it says, uh, it says, the whoredom of a woman, verse 9, the whoredom of a woman may be known in her haughty looks and her eyelids, right, in her seductive, in her seductive looks, her seductive way, her charm, all right? That's how you know a, a whore when you see one, all right? So the way she dress, the way she, the way she look, the way she act, all of that, that's how you know if you see a whore or not. All right, let's drop down and read verse, uh, Let's read verse 25, and it says, A shameless woman shall be counted as a dog, right? So we know when it, when it talks about a shameless woman, we can say a B-I-T-C-H, right, or an unclean animal, okay? But she that is shamefaced will uh, will fear the Lord. So a woman that is shameless, she's going to be counted as, as, a, as, a, uh, as a dog, all right? An unclean beast. Um. You can drop up. You can bump up to verse twenty-four. It says, "A dishonest woman con- uh, commended condemneth shame, but an honest woman will reverence her uh, will reverence her husband." All right. So that dishonest woman, that woman that's a liar, and so on and so forth. You know, she's going to what? She's going to condemn the shame. Look at that word, condemneth condemneth shame, contemptive. C O N T E M N. Yes, M N, son. You got it, Ila? Is C O N T E M N. You got it? I gotta look it up. All right, what is it? What does it say? So. Disdain, disrespect, um, look down on her form. So it says, so a dishonest woman, you're going to look down upon. You're going to despise her. So that's basically what the definition is saying, right? So a woman, so this type of woman, a dishonest woman, you're going to, you're going to despise her. You're going to hate her. All right? You're going to look down upon this woman. But like it says, but it says, but an honest woman will reverence her husband, meaning she'll respect her husband, all right? So that's the type of woman that a man will sit there and divorce, okay? But now you see that um, you see that divorce was never in the beginning anything that was supposed to was supposed to happen. Remember, marriage was supposed to be eternal. You see, the only thing that should have, that should have separated man from uh, uh, man from from his wife was death. That was it. All right, because Adam and Eve they transgressed, and remember that's what that was the judgment that the Lord pronounced death. Right, so when death came, when death came upon man, when death came upon mankind. You know what I'm saying? Marriage was no longer eternal. So now a man had to suffer losing his wife, or a wife had to suffer losing her husband. You know, somebody can you imagine being 930 years old with me, right? And then I die, and then you live another 120 years, you know. So you have to either you be married or you just going to live with, just be, be to yourself. Like Sister Judith, right, said after her husband died, she didn't want, she didn't want nobody else. But many, people, but many men desire her, you see. So, um, so that, that's basically what, basically what it was, right. So remember, marriage was supposed to be something permanent, all right. So let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 19.
and divorce was never to divorce was never to be anything that was uh you know was was supposed to never be something that you know uh was was never supposed to occur shall i say so matthew nineteen and we started verse we started uh verse three and let's let's see Christ break it down and the pharisees came the Pharisees also came with him tempting him, saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Right? So they're saying, Is it lawful for a man to put his wife for any old thing? Right? So they test they try to test Christ's knowledge in the law. They already knew, but they wanted to see what he said. And he said and he answered and said unto them, Have not ye read that which was made uh that which made them at the beginning, made them male and female. So he's going back to the creation, right? And said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So once they get married, they become one flesh. Once they consummate that marriage, that's it. All right, they're one. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together, let no man put asunder. So what the Most High has brought together, he said, let no man put asunder, right? So divorce was something with a device of, of men of sort, right? So men wanted to break up with their wives or whatnot or put away their wives, right? From the beginning, it wasn't so. That's why Christ had to, he, that's why Christ had to let them know, man, like, look, check this out, you know? What the Most High had joined together, the Most High created marriage to be permanent. You see what I'm saying? That's why I say, till death do us part. Right? So then he says in verse 7, They said unto him, Why did Moses then command give, uh, command to give, excuse me, command to give, write, uh, give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? And let's see what Christ says. He says unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, right? So now now you kind of see how it begins to unfold, right? When we went to um, Ecclesiastes chapter 25, right? So just imagine, just imagine Moses being bombarded with these cases, man, of just wicked, of just wicked wives and things of that nature, right? So then he's like, man, what am I going to do, man? They're going to end up killing each other. So you know what? Here, divorce. Just write her son. Just write her this bill and send her on her way. That's why he said Moses suffered you to do this thing, right? Well, remember that's why the Lord said He hated divorce. He hating the putting away of of a of a of a married of a married woman. All right. So He hates that actually, you know. But this is something that even the Most High had suffered. All right. So then He says. And Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So he said, like, look, in the beginning there was no such thing as divorce. In the beginning there was no, it was no such thing as divorce, right? But check this out. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication, right? So now Christ is showing you. The only way that a man can put away his wife, right, or divorce his wife now, is if he does, is if she does what? She commits fornication. I mean, she goes outside of her marriage. You see what I'm saying? And commits some sort of act of adultery. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, or um, some sort of act of fornication in general. Okay, sleeping with animals, worshiping of strange gods, whatever the case may be. So if she commits fornication, right, and shall marry another, and committed, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, let me read it again. And said unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, they said to be for fornication, and shall marry another, committed adultery, right? So that man, will, if he goes and he uh, marries another woman, right, and he put away that woman. So uh, if I put away my kazah and, you know, I go marry another woman, I just committed adultery against my kazah, right? And now check this out. Then he said this. And shall commit a, and shall marry another and committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her 
which is put away do is commit adultery. So if, if I'm sitting here and I write this woman a bill of divorce me, right, and send her out of my house, and you know, it wasn't it wasn't on no fornication, then you know what I'm saying. She marries another. She marries another man. She just committed adultery, and then a the man that sleep with that slept with that woman, he just committed adultery. You see, so that's how Christ is breaking it down now, right? So remember, he said marriage was something permanent. You know, divorce was never from the beginning. Divorce was never in the beginning. You know what I'm saying? But that's something that was instituted into the law, right? Because of the hardness of of, of people's hearts, of our people's heart, right? You know what I mean? And then that's why he had to he had to go back and force the man. Like, look, I'm gonna tell you like this. You know. Unless your wife has committed adultery, you go, you put her away, and she goes and she marries another, and you go and marry another woman, you just committed adultery against your wife. And then if you, and then if she goes and uh, finds someone else, she commits adultery, and the man that, that lays with that woman just committed adultery as well. So that's just how Christ, man, is just laying it down, all right? And then his disciples were like, damn, that, that's the case. It ain't good to me, man. We've just seen a bunch of people do this. So remember, you know, uh, definitely, you know what I'm saying, uh, just just check that out, man. Go back over it and, uh, you know, see what the Spirit, you know, tells you, man, or gives you the understanding of as well. That's the understanding that, that, that I had uh, that I had got, man, from when I was uh, reading and, and, and preparing text. All right. So um, you can also go to, uh, you can write down 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, dealing with the aspect of separation. You know, if a woman, if a woman separates herself from her husband, you know, then, uh, you know, that she has to remain unmarried, you know. Um, but if the husband, he departs, then basically he's, you know, he's she's no longer married to that man, all right? Um, same thing, vice versa, with, with the brother, all right? So if a woman does not want to act right, you know what I'm saying? Hold on. I'm just I'm just saying it real quick. If a woman does not want to act right, you know, let's go there then. First Corinthians chapter 7 and verse, uh, sorry. <clears throat> Hold on. I get, I'll see when I get there. Verse 1 is my stretch. First Corinthians chapter seven and we'll start at verse we'll start at verse seven. So it said, For I would that all men were even as uh even as myself, but every man that his, that uh hath his proper gift, one after this manner and one after that manner, all right, dealing with the aspect of marriage. And I say therefore uh, to the unmarried and widows it is it is good for them if they abide even as I, right? Meaning married, right? Have married, having self control. But check this out. But if they cannot contain, meaning if they don't have self control, if they lack self control, then let them marry. So he's like, look, if they lack self control, then let them marry. All right. And he says, for it is better to marry than to burn. So it's better to marry men than to have that extreme lust. You know, lust on you. All right, that's what he's telling the married and the widow. I mean, the unmarried and the widows, meaning the single women, the single uh, women, and the sisters that lost their husbands. All right, or that their husbands died. So now let's read on. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let the, let not the wife depart from her husband. So the wife should not depart from her husband. Okay, and it says, but if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let her let the husband uh put excuse me, let not the husband put away his wife. So sexually if you know there's a dispute or, or a disagreement but or if there's, you know, an abusive situation going on in, in the marriage or the relationship, right? You know, and the woman says, You know what, we need space. All right, we need to separate. And they come to an agreement like, you know what, we're right. You're right. We do need to separate. Well, we call it, um, in the world, they call it what? We just need some time. I just need some time to be alone. You know what I mean? But that's not for you to go out sleeping with anybody and everybody you want. It's a time for you to get yourself together. 
get yourself right. Okay. So uh I'm sorry. Picking the skin. Fuck that. Okay. So now it says, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. I'm sorry, let me verse 10. And unto the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. So this is talking about the aspect of separation. She separates herself from a certain period of time. She has to be reconciled. The only person she can reconcile herself with is to her husband, all right? And then vice versa, all right, with the husband with, you know, the husband with uh, the wife. Then it says, <clears throat> but to the rest be God, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believe not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away, meaning divorce her, you know, divorce her. All right. So showing you that, you know, um, the aspect of divorce in, in this instance uh, or, excuse me, separation, you know, and divorce, Paul is saying, like, look, don't divorce them. Don't do not do that. You know what I mean? If it's something that where it's just going to take some separation for a minute, then, you know, get yourself together and then be reconciled to one another. All right. That's, you know, if the if the two, you know, the two parties may come to that agreement. Right. But now Paul is saying this about those that those brothers and sisters who have spouses that don't fully that aren't, aren't fully with it but they're pleased as well with that person, you know? So he's talking about but to I in verse twelve, but to the rest I speak, not the Lord, right? If any brother hath a wife that believe not and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So this is the understanding that Paul is getting, all right? This is the wisdom that he's coming he's, he's coming with. So he's saying if a brother has a woman, right, that's not fully locked into the truth, he's like, look, don't leave her. You know, give, give the situation some time, man. If she feels the well to dwell with you, then, you know, still continue to be the example and allow the spirit to come on her, you know, over a period of time. But you got to be patient, right? That's the wisdom. And he says, and the woman which has a husband that believe not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So it's the same thing even with the uh even with the woman, right? She has a husband that doesn't believe. But if the husband is is uh, you know, all right with dwelling with her and he's you know, he's like, Okay, I'll put up with it, you know. But he's not fully locked in and it's saying don't leave, you know. So now it uh now it goes to say this, right? Um for the unbelieving husband, in verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, right? So meaning the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. It doesn't mean that, oh, just because the, the, the husband is not a believer in, in the scripture, he can still do whatever the hell he wants, you know, that he's sanctified. No, it's talking about him being transformed, right? Him coming, him being able to come into the night. So now he is now, now he is cleansed. You know, because of the wife now, because she's setting the example. Okay, so it'd be the same thing even for our, our, even for the women who are transitioning in the truth with their children as well. All right, so it says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. So even vice versa. All right. So now the unbelieving wife is now sanctified, or now she's cleansed. You know what I'm saying? Now, she's coming around to the doctrine because of the husband and the example that he set forth, all right? He wasn't unpatient. He wasn't overzealous or anything like that. He didn't say, get the hell out of my house. No, he was firm in his stance and believing in the truth, and he did what? He was patient with his wife, who was unbelieving, and he allowed her to grow into it because she was like she was pleased to dwell with it. We've seen certain instances of that as well. So it says, elsewhere your children unclean, but now are they holy. So now the children are no longer unclean, all right, or in a divided home, all right. It's basically dealing with doctrine, all right. So now they, the whole family is now Israel. It's not Christianity or anything like that. It's Israel. So now it says, verse 15, this dealing with, this dealing with the, the part of, you know, the permanent separation or the divorce. He says, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. 
So now if they didn't, if they're convinced in their mind, I don't want nothing to do with uh, with the doctrine of the Israelite. I don't, I don't, I'm still keep Christmas. I'm gonna still do Easter. I'm gonna still spend time with my family on my holidays. You know what I mean? I'm gonna still stroke whoever I want to and cheat and all of that. Then you know what? I'm out. If they do all that, then they just go. They gotta go, man. You know what I mean? That's why. That's why he said this. He said, "Let them depart." He said, "Let them go." You don't have to hold on to them. Let them go. They want to go. They don't want to stay. You don't have to force them to do nothing. Go. That's their life on the line. That's their salvation, man. That they used to play with and they cast off the team. Let them go. It says a brother or a sister is not under such bondage. So now you're not under the bondage of, of marriage at that point. Once that person forsakes, forsakes, uh, forsakes, and, and says, you know what, I don't want to do it anymore. They forsake the law. They depart. They say, I don't want to do it anymore. Israel is not for me. A brother or sister is not bound in such cases, right? But God has called them unto peace, meaning the Lord has called you to peace, man, in this situation. Now you're back on the market. You know what I mean? Now you can look for you a righteous man. You see what I'm saying? Now you can get you a righteous husband. I mean, excuse me, a righteous wife, all right, in those in those cases, in the interest. Uh, in those instances, so that's dealing with the aspect of, you know, divorce and separation, just in 